Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and to he who has an abundance, but from the one who, has not, who, who does not have, even what he has shall be taken away. Throw out that worthless slave into the outer darkness, into the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all His angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate, from one an- separate them from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave Me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave Me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited Me in. Naked, and you clothed Me. I was sick, and you came to visit Me. I was in prison, and you came to Me. Then the righteous will answer Him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you and the king will answer and say to them truly I say to you to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine even the least of them you did to me Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into the eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Would you pray with me one more time, brothers and sisters? Father, you are a good, good father. You are perfect in all of your ways. And we have gathered together in this place declaring that we are your children through faith in your son, Jesus. Through his death and resurrection, this is our hope. This is all that we cling to for our righteousness. We pray, Father, that as we stop to reflect on all that you have spoken to us, that you would remind us of your truth and that you would again grant us some aha moments, that you would again grant us repentance and that you would give us the grace and the strength that we need in order to conform our lives to your will and your way for your glory and for our own greatest good. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, you know how this goes. We're about to cover a lot of information. And so I want you to relax and I want you to not try and catch every single thing because I'm going to be talking rather fast for time is always against us, right? And as I do that, just relax and drink it all in. I've prepared my sermon notes in the back. If you want a copy of them, you can grab one of them on the way out. So just listen to and be reminded of all the things that we have studied as we go through. So you ready? I need everybody to say, I'm strapped in. All right, let's go. Let's go. Now, before we get into our sermons, remember the purpose for which the apostle, the disciple Matthew sat down to write this biography of the life of Jesus. Matthew sits down and his purpose is to, he writes this gospel to show to a particularly Jewish audience that Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee is the predicted king and the coming Messiah that was promised to the nation of Israel, to the people of of Israel. And Matthew chapter 25 is part of a bigger section called the Olivet Discourse. This is, you, if you remember, Jesus and his disciples made their way into Jerusalem on the Holy Week, right? And he comes in on Palm Sunday and he has confrontation and interactions with the religious leaders there. They're not really pleased with him. And Jesus has some choice words for them as he condemns their religious establishment. And then he comes into this time where he describes his second coming and then he begins to relate to his disciples how they ought to live in light of the reality of his second coming 
and of the judgment that is associated with his second coming. And Jesus told us several parables as a means of communicating our responsibility to the truth that he will come again in judgment. And so we see first in the first 13 verses in Matthew chapter 25, we see the parable of the 10 virgins. And we stopped and we, we said, well, this is strange. This is strange language. This is something that is foreign to us. And we began to unpack, listen, we began to unpack the Jewish wedding tradition. We began to understand it from the biblical context and the Jewish cultural context of what was taking place. So these ten virgins are really just bridesmaids. They're bridesmaids for a bride who has already been betrothed and engaged to an individual. And now he is coming because he has prepared a place for her. And we actually stopped to camp out on that. And brothers and sisters, I want you to get this. We took note of the value of the culture of the Jewish people, for they are indeed those who were called to be the people of God. So we can learn a lot as the people of God now from the culture of those who followed and worshipped the one true and living God. And we said, even though some of the things in their, the, the way that they, uh, two individuals came together was kind of foreign to us, and we thought, hey, that's, that's so different and so radical, and maybe it wasn't pleasing to us, we stopped to take note of the wisdom within the tradition of that culture where they saw two lives coming together as one. We talked about the fact that they had no concept of a teenager. They also had no concept of college. They also had a concept of valuing community. And there was this interdependency between demographics, right? So, so we saw that there, is, there was a value in the wisdom of the elders. The younger people valued the older people. They didn't separate themselves. They, they didn't segregate themselves from the older people. They pursued them. Because they sought wisdom from those who had lived longer than them. And the older people, they appreciated the strength and the innovativeness of the youth. And so they didn't separate themselves from young people, but they sought to give them the wisdom that God had given to them. There was an interdependency within that community. And as we looked at this parable and we saw that the, between the, the prudent uh, virgins and the foolish virgins, we saw that the bridegroom shut the door and locked out those who were foolish, who were not prudent. And we had to stop and we said, listen, this was not in any way a communication that Jesus was seeking to say, hey, you have to do a lot more things in order to enter eternal life. This was not his way of saying, hey, you got to earn your way into the kingdom of God. That is not at all what he was communicating there. And we stopped. And brothers and sisters, if you don't get anything else from today's message, I want you to hear these words again. I want you to allow them to penetrate your mind and your heart. What I'm about to say to you, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, he did not die and rise from the dead in order to create a group of morally decent people. Did you hear that? The goal is not for law-abiding, morally decent citizens. That is not why God took on flesh, came down, and ransomed humanity. Can I tell you why Jesus died and rose again? Jesus died and rose again so that you could be forgiven and that you could experience love in such a way that your own greatest affections would be captured and arrested by the one true and living God. That you would love him more than life itself. And that he would become to you a sweet, sweet savior. This is the difference between religion and relationship. He didn't die so that you could be good. He died so that you would be madly in love with him. And he has demonstrated that by first setting his affections on you and going to great lengths to ransom you and purchase your soul for heaven and for eternity. We also saw the conclusion of this parable, the point of this parable. Right there, we see it in verse 13 of ch chapter 25. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day or the hour. That was the point. The point is to be alert. Jesus tells this parable that we might be ready, stay ready. Not get ready, but stay ready for Jesus' return. And we said, how, how are we to stay ready? How are we to be on the alert? You ready? Here it is. 
It is by us living a prudent life. A prudent life. What is a prudent life? A prudent life is a life that has, uh, or, or the quality of life that stems from truly knowing God. The prudent life is one that stems from truly knowing God. And not only that, but it is marked by faithful stewardship. A life where a person truly knows God is devoting their life and all that they have to faithful stewardship to Jesus Christ. And not only that, but their lives are governed by kingdom priorities. Your lives are governed by kingdom priorities. Brothers and sisters, hear me. You don't decide the priorities of your life. God has already decided them for you. Did you hear that? You don't have that option. And so we, we ask these questions in light of our time camped out and reflecting on and studying the first 13 verses there. It gave rise to these questions. We asked ourselves these questions in reflection. Do you really love God? The question is not, should you love God? That's just an intellectual yes or no. And the answer is, yes, I should love God. That's not the question. The question is, do you love God? Are you devoted to him like the prudent, the prudent bridesmaids who said, hey, we need to take enough oil for a long time. Because of our care, because of our concern, because of our devotion and loyalty to the bride, we who have been asked to join in her celebration, we will take with us extra oil. Do you love God? Are your affections towards him, are your highest affections reserved for him? Is he the greatest source of joy in your life? Let me tell you something. If the answer is no, today is the day that you can be honest with God and you can confess to him. God, I don't understand why other people think you're such a big deal. But if you are a big deal, I'm open to making you that. But help me to see you as you are. Help me to see that there's really nothing more valuable than you. Help me to see that, God, because right now in my life, I don't. Brothers and sisters, are you passionate about God being worshipped and honored as creator? Have you ever made a decision in your life where you said, mm, I could do this, but I think God would get more glory if I did this? This is more convenient. This is more difficult. But this has greater eternal value in going the path that is narrow. Have you ever done that? Have you? Do you desire for God who created you for his glory to get out of you and every human being what he created you for? Do you love him? Here's a tricky question, and I, I like tried to, to say this and, and put it in a way that makes sense to you. So see if you can get what I'm saying here. Is what matters to you most now the same as what will matter to you when you stand before Jesus in judgment. Did that question make sense? What you're so concerned about now, will that be what you're concerned about when you stand before Jesus? Those things should be the same. And if they're not, you should repent. You should have an aha moment. And you should make what will matter when you stand before him. You should make those things what's most important to you right here and right now. And we moved on from that parable of the ten virgins to the parable of the talents. It was so rich, brothers and sisters. And we said right from the beginning, the overall point of this parable, the parable of the talents, is the same as the previous parable. It's the same point. Jesus gives another parable driving home the same point. What's the point? Be alert. Live your life now in light of the fact that Jesus is coming again. That's his point. And brothers and sisters, we derive from that parable that everything that you have has been granted to you and entrusted to you by God, and he is expecting a return on his investment. Your life and everything that you possess is God's investment, and he's expecting a return. He wants interest on your life. All that you possess ought to be producing a profit for the kingdom of God. Do you remember in the parable when he said to the wicked and lazy slave, he said, you should have put my money in the bank so that I would have received what? Interest. He gave it to them with an expectation that he would receive more than what he gave them. So it is with your life 
And so it is with everything that God has given to you. We said from that parable that laziness is a sin. And the scriptures talk about that. In essence, laziness is us robbing God of the time that he has entrusted to us. We are called to redeem the time. And laziness is not helping us to redeem the time. We also saw a very scary and sober moment, brothers and sisters. As we looked at the implications of this parable, we saw the prevalence, the prevalence of false conversions and false confessions. I'll say it to you again. You calling yourself a Christian doesn't make you any more a Christian than me walking into a garage and calling myself a car makes me a car. You are not a Christian because you say you are. You are a Christian because God Almighty has regenerated your soul has made you new. He has invaded your life, interrupted your life, interceded in your life, and he has done something to you transcendent, supernatural, with which there will be fruit. And if there is no fruit, there is no proof, and you should have no comfort that you are truly, as we sang this morning, a child of God. What we have been given was not given to advance our own personal agendas. But everything that we are and everything that we have, God has entrusted to us that we might accomplish his purposes and his plan in this world. And that gave rise to these questions of reflection for us, brothers and sisters, as we meditated on that passage in that parable. Are your personal interests the same as God's interest and agenda? Are they the same? If you call yourself a follower of Christ, if you call him the Lord of your life, there should not be two separate agendas. There should be one agenda, his and you carrying it out. Amen? We also asked ourselves this question in light of that beautiful verse. What will you hear Jesus say to you on the day that he calls you to settle accounts with your master? the one you claim is your master, the one you claim has right to control your life and make decisions for you. My hope for me and for all of you, brothers and sisters, is that we will hear the words of Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21, where Jesus says, his master will say to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into, look, look at what he says. Enter into the joy of your master. He, he doesn't say enter into the labor of your master. Enter into the status of your master. He says enter into the joy of your master. The delight, the pleasure of your master. That is for those who have been found faithful. Whose confession is just a result and a manifestation of what God has done in you. Amen? That fo following that parable, we actually looked at it again and we got down to the nitty gritty. Do you remember that, brothers and sisters? We, we began to camp out and unpack this concept of biblical stewardship. Do you remember the two principles of biblical stewardship? The first one, we said this that you do not own anything because God is the owner of everything. Amen. And we said this second principle that follows it, that coincides with it is this, that God has appointed human beings to be creative stewards or managers of his goods. So we see this pattern, we see this paradigm that God has installed, that God is the owner of everything and that he has created human beings to be managers of his goods. You are his goods, your abilities are his goods, and everything that you possess are God's goods that he has entrusted to you. Wouldn't it be weird if you went into work and you clocked in, and then you either ignored your boss, or you told your boss what you were going to be doing all day? Wouldn't that be weird? Because your boss is the owner of the company, right? That would be weird, right? So it is, it would be weird for us to live our lives without acknowledging God who is our owner and our boss and what his agenda is for our lives. Amen? The kingdom of God belongs to those who willfully acknowledge Jesus' rightful ownership of everything. 
Does that rub you the wrong way when you say you don't own anything because God is the owner of everything? Does it rub you wrong? Is, is there any place in your heart where you're like, mm, no, nah, he doesn't really get to tell me what to do? Does it rub you wrong? Or, or maybe it doesn't rub you wrong because you're intellectually acknowledging that. But in practice, you are not seeking God's will. You are not prayerfully considering God in your decision making. There's a difference between intellectually acknowledging something and practically, practically allowing God's truth to dictate and make decisions for you. Does it rub you the wrong way? Heaven is reserved for those who say, I am not my own. I belong to God. Everything that I have is God's and everything that I do should reflect his purposes, his plan and his agenda. How does your heart relate to the principles of biblical stewardship? And then we highlighted four areas of life. We highlighted four areas of life of which God will hold us accountable. We talked about life, bios. We talked about health, our own physical health. And we said this, in light of the biblical stewardship, we said that your body belongs to God. Your body belongs to God. It's not yours. You don't get to do whatever you want with your body because it's not your body. It's God's. And he designed it. And he decides how we ought to relate to it and conduct ourselves in this temporary tent. And we said, if that be true, how then should we live? Brothers and sisters, we should be intentional with our bodies. We should be proactive and not reactive with our diets and our physical activities. For we only got one body. We must take care of it and honor God with it as good stewards. So we talked about health. We also talked about time. And we said this, in light of biblical stewardship of God owning everything, that time, when it comes to time, your time belongs to God. It's not yours. Time is not yours. God has marked out the day you come into this world and the day, you the day you leave it. Your time on this earth is not yours. It's his. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? God has given you time on this earth and we are called, listen, we are called to redeem the time, not to kill time or to waste time. It is a sin for Christians to consider themselves bored. Are you bored? Do you find yourself bored? You don't have a right to be bored. Do you know God in his fullness? No. Then you have something to do that can keep you from being bored. Do you know the scriptures by memory from Genesis to Revelation? Then you don't have anything to be bored about. Get to work. Have you shared the gospel with every person in your sphere of influence? No. Then you don't have a reason or a right to be bored. Amen? Amen? Okay, excellent. Okay, you still with me? We also talked about this, and, and I hope that you, you get this, brothers. This is, brothers and sisters, this was paradigm shifting for me. We need to stop saying we are too busy. That is not pleasing to God that we are too busy, right? It's not pleasing to God. What we need to say is this. Whenever you're tempted to say, I'm too busy, what you need to say is this. I'm actually a poor manager of my time and my priorities. If you are bored or if you are busy, then you are not balanced and in God's will. Do you hear that? Oh, I was going to do this thing that God wanted me to do, but I was too busy. No, you weren't. You weren't too busy. You are a poor manager of both your time and your priorities because what God wanted you to do should have taken precedence over whatever it was that you were doing when God wanted you to be doing something else. Amen? Is that clear? This principle arises. Our responsibilities come before our recreation. What God obligates us to comes before what we choose to do with our free time. And our responsibilities dictate how much free time that we actually have. And brothers and sisters, as believers, we should be functioning on kingdom principles and kingdom priorities. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Right? Seek first. That's a prioritizing. 
to seek first God's will and what God wants for your life and to entrust God to provide for you when what he wants for you is consuming your time. Amen? Amen? So how should we live in light of our stewardship to time? Brothers and sisters, we should be intentional and we should be proactive and not reactive about how we spend our time. We should budget our time like we budget our money. We are also given the stewardship of responsibility to relationships. You have relationship responsibilities that you will have to answer to God for. What are those relationships? What, what is the number one relationship that we should all be committed to and we should all be investing our time and our life into? Our relationship with God. And then God gives us a pecking order, a hierarchy, as far as prioritizing the other relationships in our life, right? Our spouse, our children, our extended family, our church family, neighbors, strangers, and even our enemies. We have a responsibility to all of these relationships. But God also gives us relationships to institutions, organizations of people groups that he has given us, right? So what are those what are those institutions that God says that we will be responsible for and held accountable for? Well, we have the institution of the church. We have a responsibility to our local church as a part of the universal church of Christ. Our local church family, we have a responsibility to them. And you know, it's interesting, this past week as we had our elders meeting, we sat and Pastor Tim asked us, he said, where are we as a family in harmony with what God has spoken to us and calls us to do? And where are we as a family missing it? Where are we falling short of what God has called us to be and do as a local church? And brothers and sisters, just as you ask yourself that as an individual, it is wise for us as a family of God to reflect on that and to be honest with ourselves and to ask ourselves that as well. Do you hear me? And one elder raised this, this concern. He said, you know, God has blessed us with a, a, a decent sized family here. And he says, but you know something? I never feel like we feel the the fullness of that family because some weeks some people show up and then other people don't and, and then it's like it's reversed the next week those people who weren't there show up and then the people who did show up weren't there and we never feel the fullness of the family and the community and the potential that God has given to us and brothers and sisters I want you to know something and I want to say this to you because we live in a culture right now where commitment is not something to be esteemed. Commitment is not something to be valued. And, and it's this weird thing that is foreign to me. I don't know if times have changed from the time I was 14 and became a Christian, but I was taught and understood biblically that as a Christian, you go to church. I was taught that. That's a part of the expression of your love and devotion to God. That you forsake not the assembling together of God's people. And brothers and sisters, that's not a strong suggestion. That is a command. That is the paradigm that we find in the scriptures. That the believers, the followers of Jesus, the, the people of the way, they were meeting together, gathering together. They made a practice of gathering together on the first day of the week, which was the Lord's day. They did that, and there was no casualness about it. But what we find is that there's a casualness, there's a casual relationship to the clear command of Scripture, that we forsake not the gathering together of one another. And brothers and sisters, you have to look beyond yourself, because I want you to know something. You are a blessing to each person here when you're here. Just your presence. I sing to the Lord in the shower when it's just me and the Lord. I do that, and it's wonderful. But it's nothing like being in here and having my terrible voice drowned out by the beauty of the saints singing unto God. There is something about it. And brothers and sisters, not only is it special, not only is it good, but it is right. It is right. And the times that we are not in the gathering, listen to me. 
they should be an exception to the case. When we're not here, it's an exception. Not like this casual, oh, I made it two out of four times. No. No. This is what you do as worship to God and you offer to the people of God. You love God by loving others, by being in the gathering because you have something to offer. This isn't you coming into a building and passively sitting back and saying, "Uh, yep, I was there. You see that, God? See? No. If that's you, you are still under the impression of religion. It is good to be in the house of God with God's people. And we have an obligation and a responsibility to the institution of the local church. Now go and tell that to everybody who's not here this morning. (laughs) What other institutions do we have a responsibility and obligation to? Government. We have a responsibility to government to submit to every human institution under God. Labor, when you work, you conduct yourself in relationship to them as God has instructed us in the scriptures. Community, your neighborhoods, we have an obligation to our neighborhoods and we have an obligation to the institution of education. Now, brothers and sisters, I didn't really unpack this because we never have enough time, but let me just say this in short, that the government does not own your children. They don't, your children don't belong to the government. They belong to God. And they've been entrusted to you. Now hear me now, parents. Hear me now. You will stand accountable to God for your children's education. And if you choose to put your children into the public school system, and to give them over to an institution that is profoundly atheistic, I want to share something with you. You better be very careful. You better be very careful that you are still the primary influence in your child's life. Because the public school systems are profoundly atheistic. And then when you get to the academic institutions of higher learning, they're not just atheistic, they're socialistic and communistic. Profoundly unashamedly and this is what we give our children over to and then we question why their faith is being rattled we question why they're having doubts in their beliefs in God because we subject them and pay for them to be inundated and indoctrinated with atheistic rhetoric okay I'm stepping off my soapbox we also have a responsibility to God, and we will stand accountable to God for our resources, brothers and sisters. Your private property, your abilities, and the gospel, all of those things belong to God. Your money, your possessions, your abilities, listen, your spiritual gifts that God has given you to minister to one another in the gathering of the saints as we gather together, your spiritual gifts and the responsibility to share the gospel, all of those things belong to God and he has entrusted them to you and you are called by God to administer those things and to place those things in areas according to God's will, according to God's will. So let me ask you this question in light of all that nitty gritty talk about biblical stewardship. Are you drifting through life or, or are you living life intentionally in light of our responsibilities to God? If you notice, brothers and sisters, with every one of those stewardships, those areas of stewardship, health, time, relationships, and resources, how should we respond to them? By being intentional. We should respond to them by being proactive, not reactive. And I, I just want to stress something to you right now. I'm going to tell you something, and I'm going to be completely transparent at the sake of offending you, but so willing to hear you say, you're absolutely wrong, Pastor Joe. I'm going to tell you something. I don't think very many of us sit down and wrestle and think deeply about the principles of Scripture and our bodies, our relationships, time, and our resources. I don't think we do that. I don't think we prayerfully consider where we should be putting those things and how we should be conducting ourselves in light of them. I don't think so. You know why? Because it wasn't until my later years as a Christian that I began to do those things. And I hope you're not like me. I hope that it clicked for you when you became a Christian and you said, Jesus is my Savior. You also said, Jesus is my 
Lord, right? Because Jesus is Savior of none, of whom he is not also Lord, right? If he's not your Lord, he's not your Savior. And the Lord has so much to say in his word with wisdom of how we should conduct our life, our time, our relationships, and our resources. If that's not you, why aren't you drinking more coffee and talking about these things? You should be. Are you seeking people out to do these things? You absolutely should be. Otherwise, you're just drifting through life and you're going to get to the end of it saying, wait, God had something to say about those things? I don't even want to reflect on whether or not I've been found faithful with those things because I don't even know what God had to say about them. That would be sinful, brothers and sisters. So let me ask you this question. Is your life marked, characterized by lifelong learning, lifelong repentance, and lifelong wrestling? Are those things marks of your life? Do you think you know enough? Or are you constantly seeing and learning what God has to say? The more you learn, the more you will repent. And the more you repent, the more you will wrestle with. All right, God, if, if this is what your word says and this is my situation, how do I conform my situation to the principle and the truthfulness of your word? What does that look like for me as a Christian in 2019 in Ocean City? What does that look like? Help me, God. Help me to live out your principles here and now. We looked at this last section, Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, and there we saw Jesus describing the judgment associated with his second coming, his parousia. And we saw the metaphor of, of the shepherd separating the sheep from the goats, right? And we took note of this very important truth, that when it all comes down to it, brothers and sisters, hear me. The only demographics that will matter to God in the final analysis is Christian and non-Christian. That is it. There's plenty of other demographics, categories, statistical analysis that we could all fit into. But when it comes down to what God says and God's will, he only wants to know, what have you done with my son, Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord or is he not? Is he your king or is he not? That's the only thing that will matter. And we see that from this description of judgment. We also saw the reality of eternal punishment. Eternal punishment, brothers and sisters. There will be a separation of souls unto punishment and unto reward. And I just want to give you a glimpse of this because I don't think enough of us even think about these things. Look back at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 51. Listen to these words. These are the words of Jesus Christ. And he will cut him to pieces and, sign, and assign him a place with the hypocrites in that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, now flip over to chapter 25 and look at verse 12. But he answered them, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Drop down to verse 30. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Drop down to verse 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. Drop down to verse 46. And these will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. These are the words of Jesus. Do not mistake them. No matter how many positive, motivational preachers tell you love, love, love all day, the God of the scriptures is a God who loves perfectly, but he is a God of justice who will ultimately deal with all evil in the world. Make sure that you are not on the side of evil, but on the side of grace, those who have been forgiven. And as we looked at this 
parable here and this description of the coming judgment, brothers and sisters, again, we found ourselves with a little bit of tension as we did with the other parable saying, well, it seems to be that they're predicating a person's eternal destiny on their works. What did we say? How did we understand that in light of the grander scope of the scriptures that we are saved not by works but by grace through faith? How did we reconcile those things? We said this, that Christianity is not a systems, a system of works-based salvation. But, but listen, here's, here's where we got to understand it. We said that rather our God-given righteousness and our salvation comes through sincere faith. But but that sincere faith is proven by a, lo- a life of love and service towards others. Your faith that saves you is proven, validated, substantiated, verified by how you love and serve those who are important to God, those who bear the image of God. I hope that you understand that, brothers and sisters. The proof of our love for God is that we are charitable towards those whom God loves. I hope that that makes sense. And we finished up that parable seeking to understand the roles of government and of church and of our our responsibilities and our role as individual believers in Christ. And, And can I just say, it is extremely relevant and it is of great importance that we understand the God given roles of government, of church, and of each individual Christian because we are living in a culture, in a time under a governmental system that is increasingly taking the roles that God has ordained in other institutions, they are taking those roles and they are implementing them according to the secular standards, i.e. education. You are responsible for your children's education to impress upon them the truthfulness of the one true and living God and how they ought to live in this world in light of his reality. But somewhere along the way in our great American civilization, we have delegated that to the secular sphere. And in doing that, now we are subjecting ourselves to the standards of a democratic, universal variety of ideas and beliefs and standards. Do you hear that? Be very careful. Be very sober-minded and know what the Bible says the job of the, the government is, the job of the church is, and the job of each individual Christian. Amen? Just a few things that we looked at. <laughs> that gave rise to these questions. Do you truly believe in the coming judgment of Christ? And again, I'm not asking you an intellectual question. I'm not asking you a question of whether or not you should or should not believe in the coming judgment of Christ because it's right here. It says that he's coming. The question is, do you actually believe it? Now, again, where's the proof that you believe it? That you're living your life in light of his coming. Is there any charity present in your life? Apart from what you are delegating to the local church, is there any charity present? in your life? Is there any loving of others out of a love for God outside of the institution of the church? Should be. That's exactly what Jesus talked about. The sheep are the ones who are mindful of those who are in need. The last question. Are you a sheep or a goat? Are you a wolf? Or are you a goat in sheep's clothing? You'd be very sober and very wise to reflect on these things, brothers and sisters. And as we come to the end of our study in Matthew 22, I just want to encourage you with the very same principle that we hear. No teaching has happened where no learning has happened. And no learning has happened where no application has happened. If you're not applying these truths to your life, you can't say you've learned. And if you can't say you've learned... I can't say I've taught, and I have a problem with that. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says this, Examine yourself. Test yourself to see that you are in the faith. Amen?
Let's pray together. Wow, Lord. So much. So much that you have shown us, that you have revealed to us, that we have discovered by sitting and meditating on your word. And to be perfectly honest, Lord, I think I can speak for all of us when, when I say that we are overwhelmed. And it's a lot, Lord. It's a lot to take in. But we also want to be mindful of your grace. Your grace that not only forgives us when we fall short, but that very same grace that helps us little bit by little, by little bit to conform our lives to your will. That we might look more like Jesus until we see him face to face. Help us, Lord. Help us as a family to be committed to that, to be committed to you, to your will, to each other, and to sharing the gospel with those who still need his forgiveness. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.